2016, 17, 18, I can't remember version. If you want to get it from the library, it is, it's got a fantastic lot of theory around motor control and motor learning. And it's got a really good um, chapter on neuroplasticity. Shumway Cook and Woolacott. But you can, um, yeah, the, the library might have it. Um, it's, anyway, that's what it is. Uh, it's written by physios. So, you know, it's fairly bland because we are that kind of people, but um, it's good. All right. So what is motor learning? Now, what's motor learning as distinct from learning? Well, hopefully you'll see that it's not actually that much different. And you could argue that m this kind of learning is what we do fundamentally right from birth. Um, and then the co more cognitive learning, if you like, um, is actually overlaid on top of this sort of the motor learning um, networks. So from a neurological point of view, they're not actually that different, but we've segmented them for some reason in study. So it's the study of the acquisition and or modification of movement. Um, because this lecture, you know, I often give to clinicians, it's motor learning obviously happens, excuse the language, like normal and patient populations. So it can be relearning, you know, when you've got a, a constraint from a disease like a stroke or, you know, so they have to relearn how to do something when you've got maybe one arm or leg that doesn't do what it used to do. Um, acquisition and reacquisition of movement skills lost through injury. Okay, so next slide. Now here's the parallel between neuroplasticity and learning. So neuroplasticity and learning are the same thing. <laughs> it's not just even a parallel. They are the same thing. All right. The, the way learning is manifested in the brain is the neuroplastic changes. So if we say that neural modifiability, which is neuroplasticity, uh, changes in synaptic efficiency, if those changes are persisting, then we get longer term changes in synaptic connections. That is simply the physiological way of saying that when we learn something, we get short-term changes, we, can learn, we learn something. If we continue to practice, that learning becomes more embedded and then we get long-term changes so it can become a habit. It's the same thing, okay? So when people say to you, and I think I've made this comment in the room before, when the Deutsch books came out, people started to ring me up saying, oh, do you do neuroplasticity therapy? I go, well... Yes, and my facetious answer is, and so does your piano teacher. You know, because we're all about learning. Yeah, no. You're, well, you know, with my voice, it probably was facetious, but it's true. It's a true thing, yes. You know, your dance teacher, your anything, any time that you're learning, if you, you know, if you buy a packet of crisps and you've never learned how to open that packet, it's a different kind of packet, that's a neuroplastic phenomenon is going to happen. You're going to experiment and learn how to open that packet. You know, when you do that exploration about do I pull, do I rip, do I do this, do I do that? And then the next time you have the packet, you know how to open it. By the learning, neuroplasticity, it's happened. So we don't have to have therapy for it. <laughs> um, however, the, it, it is an interesting question about how do we maximise this capacity to learn? And change our brains. So the next slide is what's my definitions acquiring the capability for skilled action and why I'm putting these words up there is that you can you know you can use these words on, on your brochures because this is what we offer we're actually offering learning so the capability acquiring the capability for skilled action doesn't that fit in with our target model for yesterday an ATM is the opportunity to acquire the capability for skilled action. And these are books, these are, these are definitions coming out of textbooks. It results from experience and or practice. Cannot be measured directly, i.e. it's inferred. And this is why it's so hard to research the Feldenkrais method because people, the bastards are learning. And how do you measure learning? You know, it's really hard. You can only see a behaviour change and then it's which behaviour is going to change. We don't know. And, and learning produces relatively permanent changes if, if there is learning. If it's simply a performance 
change, like it's in the moment. And the example I give here is, you know, when you're playing tennis and you hit, you know, in a moderately efficient way, then you have a day when you just, you just, everything hits the sweet spot and you think, wow, that's fantastic. And then you can never do it again. That's not learning because you can't reproduce it. That's just lucky. And you just go, this is a blessed day. And you thank whichever deity you like and hope you have another one. Flick it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You might overthink it and then you over effort and then you ruin it, or it can be that beginner's luck kind of thing. Okay, so next one. Now, there's a broader definition of motor learning that involves more than the motor processes. Now, as Feldenkrais, um, um, emergent Feldenkrais practitioners, that's such a der statement. But in my world, I'm still struggling to get people to understand that motor learning in, requires an improvement in sensing as well as moving. Um, and, I, and I still, when I write grants, talk about this, people still go, sensing, who cares? Like, really? Who cares? So anyway, so yesterday, uh, two days ago, I talked about, this used to be called sensory motor learning, but now we're tending to call it more perception, cognition, action, because it's, a more, it's not just sensation in, movement out. There's the practicing how and what to sense in terms of perception, making even more sense of those senses, which is the cognition, making decisions and problem solving, solution finding, and then acting. So we've put, if, and if you want to, this is, again, this is a der statement for Feldenkrais practitioners because we've always said it's about thinking, sensing, feeling, and doing. Now, in this technical language, they've left out the feeling, they've left out the emotions, but we've put them in there, in the thinking, feeling, sensing, doing. That's nice. See how smug we are as Feldenkrais Cross practitioners? The way I teach, uh, this is what the textbooks say, we know so much more. This is the Feldy smug business. It's okay, isn't it? It's okay to be smug. So searching for task solutions or new strategies emerges from interactions with the individual with the task or the function the meaningful action and the environment so that fits in with one of those articles that Zoran gave you um i only read the abstract of it. i didn't read the whole thing but that talked about the influence of the environment didn't it yes and the influence of the task or the function so for us we need to study motor learning in the context of the ways individuals solve issues with functional tasks in specific environments You could, yeah. Yep. Yep. The internal environment, when we look at the next slide, probably is part of the individual in terms of in, in sensing. But the, the specific environment, I, it, you do need to be broader about the environment. It's, not, it's the whole ecology of where you are. So it's the culture and um, the social aspects of your environment, as well as the spatial features of the environment and the time, you know, the temporal aspects of the environment. So your point about the environment, you need to be very big about what you think is in the environment. It's the objects in the environment. You know, so for Julieta, the environment, in, you know, is very, the, the shape of the roller is, is the environment that's really influencing her current motor behaviour for example. Shoes are part of the environment. Clothes are part of the environment. It's, you know, all of those things are part of the environment. So it's big. It's broad. Okay. So the next one is, so forms of learning. Some of you know about this. There's some really simple forms of learning. So, and you can split, there's two main categories of non-associative learning and associative learning. Non-associative learning is where it's not linked, it's, it's not, doesn't link into big chains of action. So there's this thing that happens to neurons. If you, if you give a, a particular single stimulus to a neuron that synapses to the next neuron and you keep doing it, the neuron will do one of two things. It will either habituate, so it will stop firing, 
or it will become sensitized and it will increase firing. So I either ramp down or ramp up. Now, if you think about this in a behavioral sense, if I just keep talking at you and saying the same thing over and over again, 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 you'll either switch off to me, switch off to the stimulus of my voice, you'll habituate to it, you won't respond to it, or you get sensitized and you, for fuck's sake, shut up, that's sensitized. Yes, so you can see behaviourally we're not different to our neurons, that we will have a habituating response or a sensitising response. And that's, that's, that's just how it is. There's those two possibilities. Um, so they're two, they're, and that's actually a form of learning in a way, so that now every time I say, what was the phrase I was kept on repeating that was obnoxious? If I keep on repeating what I was saying, if I keep on repeating what I was saying... If I just say that one thing again, it will probably it will tip you into hypersensitive or switch you off. So you've learned to respond in a different way, in a, in a sort of habit, in a way to that. Does that make sense? It's very simple learning, and um, that yeah, from a behavioural point of view, yeah, yeah. Now this, oh sorry, go back to sensory learning. Now sensory learning is a really interesting learning that. Um, um, is now actually called perceptual learning. Um, and when I came across this from a theoretical point of view, I got very excited because when this actually is what we do in ATM a lot, when there is no goal and, there's no, and you are simply sensing what is happening and you're simply using senses to explore a space with no particular goal in mind, this is, this is sensory or perceptual learning. Um, and it is slowly coming back into the literature a bit as maybe something that's interesting. It was it was kind of written about you know decades ago about what is what babies do when when babies pick up an object and shove it in their mouth. They have no goal about the object. They just want to know what it what it is, like it's a recognition kind of thing. They're just exploring it for the sake of it. They don't know actually what it is. They don't even know about recognizing it or naming it or anything. They're just exploring it. Blah, 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 blah you know, the shape of it, the feel of it, the texture of it, the taste of it, simply to know it. And that's often what we're doing in ATM. And it's unusual for adults to do it. But little babies do it all the time and they slowly stop doing it because they, they want a goal. They become goal-directed. So the thing about perceptual or sensory learning is it's no goal-directed. It's, no, it's, it's an open question. What is this? What does it taste like? What does it look like? Blah, 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 you know, etc. Yeah. Okay, so that's non-associative learning. Uh, next is associative learning. So this is what you know. This is sort of the Skinner box, old psych lectures um, about classic, classical and operant conditioning. So classical conditioning is where two stimuli are linked. So there's an association of things. They're linked together. That's what association means. And we use associations to predict consequences, causation, etc. So the original classical um, conditioning paradigm was Pavlov's dog. Do you remember the story? So the dog is presented with a bowl of food um, and a bell. the bell is rung at the same time as it gets the food. Yes, that's right. And you, so, and you associate a whole range of, for you, pleasurable conditions about lying on your mat because there's all those associations with the mat. You have a certain set of expectations about lying on your mat um, and you go into that. And sometimes we disrupt those associations and sometimes we don't. Now, your students won't have those associations with the mat lying on the floor will bring up a whole lot of other associations about falling and be, will I be able to get up and it'll be really hard and how do you, you can't you know yeah and then they start having it you you change the associations so you change the bell to a something else <laughs> um okay so you pair those two things together they get associated even though they're not necessarily they don't have a, a link in reality. There is nothing actually in reality that links a bell with the smell of food. 
but in the dog's mind, they're now linked. Uh, and then you can just ring the bell, of course, and the dog will salivate. You don't even have to have the food there. And that, so that's a, it's a conditioned response. Um, and some of my colleagues um, have been looking at pain as a conditioned response. So that people will do a movement. And because in the past, that movement has been associated with pain, they only have to do the movement and they will experience a pain. Or they only have to think about the movement and they'll experience a pain. So um, pain as a, as a classically conditioned response is a little bit sexy at the moment. I think it, it's more complicated than that. But anyway, you can read those papers. Um, now, operant conditioning is trial and error learning. And again, this should ring a bell, excuse the pun about the classical, this should ring true to you around the kind of learning that we are interested in in Feldenkrais, which is trial and error learning, where if it's something feels better, we'll, 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 you, we'll do it more. If something feels effortful, we'll do it less. So the classic operant conditioning is, I remember as an undergrad when we had to, um, you know, set up an operant conditioning trial. And so classic, the, not the classic, the obvious one that I did was, I was really bad at studying as an undergrad, like really bad. So I would reward myself with a chocolate bar if I did study. So that's, that's the most basic kind of operant conditioning is that you get a reward. Now, the inherent reward in Feldenkrais with trial and error learning is if it feels better and it's pleasurable. So it's the pleasure that's the reward. And that's why we highlight the pleasure aspect of it as a positive reward for, you know, less effort and so forth. So that's, what, that's an important nugget to always have in your lessons, that we, that we move towards pleasure. And, of course, there are some really sick folk in society who move away from pleasure and into pain because somehow or other pain and pleasure have become associated with each other. And I say sick, I don't mean in, in, in a um, judgment. I mean, I think it's a, that's sick. That's, that's not a well, well, that's not a well response to um, find pleasure in pain. However, you know, we need to recognise that there are some people who do. Not people who usually come to classes, I'd have to say, but there are. Um, okay, so it's the law of effect. Now, th there's another kind of learning procedural versus declarative, and this fits in with memory as well. Um, so procedural learning can be performed without attention. Um, so this is when we're really cementing a habit or we're turning something that's quite conscious learning into a very habitual procedural kind of um, movement. So it leads to automaticity. Um, so what we're doing in Feldenkrais is we're uncovering what we've learnt as a procedural thing and exposing it and actually turning it into a declarative thing like it's known so that we can consciously think about it and then we practice that in a more conscious way and, think, and then it can become procedural, like we get a new habit. It becomes procedural again. Does that make sense? Sort of. A new habit. But maybe in, you know, what ha might happen in an ATM is we come in with one habit um, and then we end with the ATM with five possible habits. So we've got a choice of habits then. Yeah, so they're not quite so um, fixed or limited. Yeah, so we're actually using this procedural and declarative stuff quite a lot. Um, so declarative requires attention and reflection um, and it becomes procedural with repetition. So, again, you have, you have to get this across to your students that when, some, when they notice something changes, the change might last. It might last. The system might adopt it just by that, just from one ATM. Chances are it might require repetition, though, for it to be more procedural. For them to exchange one habit for a, a couple of others, it might require practice. So that's where the ending of the lesson is really important 
so that they know that this is not what I'd call a wham bam. Thank you, ma'am. It, you know, where it's just a nice feeling that might go. If they're interested in this, how can they go about incorporating it as a new habit? Both excellent answers, yes, and it is an and or. So if I say that for the tape, the one is that they could recapitulate that learning by doing aspects of the ATM and or they could incorporate aspects of that ATM, their attention to aspects that they felt experienced in the ATM, noticing them in their real life. And they are two excellent strategies that I highly encourage you to think about to end your lesson. Yep. Now, sometimes with ATM, if you know that it's a real winner of an ATM, I do this with my clients when because I, it's an FI situation, but I'm giving them an ATM, is I'll write down a few snips for them of the ATM, if need be. Actually, all the other thing that I do is because ATM, I think, is so important. Maybe I've told you this, um, is I've got a Feldenkrais resources box in my Dropbox and I've got a whole bunch of ATMs sitting in there and I'll send them the link to the Dropbox and say, I, I would, you know, I'm recommending that you do lesson blah, blah. And then from that lesson, pick out three or four things that are really useful for you that you can do in the car chair or in the you know, airport lounge or at your computer or something like that. So that's another really um, tacit way of extending the lesson into real life. Otherwise, I'll refer them to ATM classes. Yeah. Um, and it's sort of been emphasised to us that you would need to do that repetition of the ATM with a wing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So again, for the tape. So the problem I have, because a lot of my clients know that I'm also a physio, is that they will go into that and say, well, how many times do you want me to do this? And that's a giveaway that they think it's an exercise. So then I have to deconstruct that exactly as you said to say it's it's actually not an it's not an exercise for your body. This is actually about training your brain to pay attention to what you just told me that you felt. So bringing it back to what they've they've experienced, and it's 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 a training your brain to pay attention to your body. So how many times do you need to repeat that? Many times as you can, the more the better. Okay, so that's that kind of learning. Uh, we don't need to, that slide's bullshit. I don't, well, it doesn't interest me. I can't, I can't see the relevance of it, so it's just in there for undergrads. Now, these, these are different frameworks to think about the journey of motor learning. And they're three different ones, and they're a bit like the frameworks that we've given you. No one of them explains the journey, so that's why there's three, at least three. So one possible set of experiences that someone can have when they're learning something new is that when they first start doing it, it's really cognitive. They're really thinking about it and requires a lot of attention. Then as they do it, they make more associations. So they chunk more bits of information together and then it becomes more automatic. So my classic example for this, for all of you who've learned to drive a car, is remember when you first sat behind the wheel to drive how many things, different things you had to think about and it was absolutely exhausting and you, it was so hard. You had to think about the steering and you had to think about the gears and you had to think about the brake and the clutch and the accelerator and the indicator and the radio and the this and the that. And you, it was just like multitasking on speed. Now, gradually over time, you, you start associating different things. I, I think I've said this in ATM that, um, you know, the, the clutch and the gear become chunked together. So instead of thinking about the gear stick as something different to the clutch, in terms of your control of it, they become one thing. 
and then the steering and the indicator become one thing. And then gradually the whole, all those individual tasks become the one task of driving. So this is a process of associations, of linking seemingly disparate things into one coherent action, activity. And we do it a lot in ATM. We either start off with the big movement and we break it down into little chunks and then we put it back again, maybe with different associations, or we start off with little chunks and then we build them up with more and more associations into a big chunk, or we do, you know, we've got various sets of tactics around how we fiddle around with these associations, pulling them apart and putting them back together again in order for them to be somewhat automatic. Um, the novice advanced expert stage is um, this, we've, we've talked about degrees of freedom in here. It's not a political statement. That's my joke. Each joint has a number of degrees of freedom. So the, the joint on the end of your, like that joint, that IP joint, has one degree of freedom. It can only move in flexion extension, so one plane. It's got one axis and one plane. The same with the middle knuckle. The, the end knuckle of your finger, not the, so the proximal, that one, has got two. It can go forwards and backwards and left and right. So it's got two degrees of freedom. Now, you can say it goes circular, but that's, it's not, it's not, it hasn't, it's, that's a combination. It's called, just is not, it's not, yes, it goes through planes, but it's not a true, it's not a true rotation that can't rotate around itself. It's, it's, it's a single point. So the thumb, on the other hand, has got complete rotation. You just have to take my word for this. This has three degrees of rotation because it can turn around itself. It's hard, but you can. It can turn around a vertical axis. Um, the shoulder joint can turn around its own axis like that. And the hip can. It's got three degrees of freedom. It can turn around like that. That's the third degree. That's the third range as opposed to that and that. This is actually a combination of the other two, which is why. Um, that's how it is. It's biomechanics. Can't argue with it. It's God. It's just isn't it? It's just God. Uh, it's a technical. Anyway, so we've got we've got all these different degrees of freedom. One, two, or three degrees of freedom in different joints. Now you add them all together, we have got a absolute crap load of possible movements. If you think about all of the different joints just in our arm, all the different possible moves it could do. So what this guy actually said was, the problem with movement is not about doing the movement, it's about stopping all the other possibilities. Because the possibilities are so much more than the one thing that you want to do. So this guy, Newell and others, said that the problem of movement and motor learning is about controlling the degrees of freedom, not producing the, the freedom, the, the movement. So it's an interesting idea. And we all know that we do this. So when you're a novice, you over control the degrees of freedom. And that's stiffness. When people feel stiff, you know, when you first pick up a golf club or something, I don't know why I use sport as an example because I don't play any sport at all. Yeah, you over control, over co contract the degrees of freedom. And then as you become more advanced expert, then you actually release degrees of freedom just enough to produce the movement and then what you experience is more efficient movement that's more adaptable and it's more coordinated now this i tell you this lecture is a lecture written for physio students everything pretty much that i'm saying it should be resonating in your head about feldenkrais you should find this immensely reassuring that what we do is totally understood by movement science. Quite apart from all the psychological stuff, we said, I'm a psychologist, I could put up a psychology lecture and hopefully that theory would fit this as well. So, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a movement scientist. I come at it from this framework. Um, not to say that I can't use the other frameworks, but anyway. So this should be immensely reassuring. You don't have to even remember it because actually you know this. You know that this is, this is the experience that you have is that when you start off 
a movement beginning of the ATM, it feels stiff and awkward. That's the novice stage. As you go into the advanced and become an expert at it, you feel more efficient, less effort, more adaptable, more coordinated. That is the hallmark of an expert mover. And that's what we're after. And then finally, the first stage or second stage, mm, this is somewhat relevant. Gentili was really interested in saying that we don't want to learn anything unless we know what the goal is. Now, interestingly, in Feldenkrais, we, at the beginning of the ATM, we don't know. And your early students will want to know. They'll say, what's this for? Like, what are you doing this for? They want, they want a goal. They want to know what it's for. You have to say, suspending all that, it's perceptual learning. There is no goal. But you know there's a goal. There is a goal. It's this goal, but it's just not, you're not going to state it up front because you don't want it to get in the way. So we actually play around with this idea of that it's important to understand the goal because we actually suspend that. And then the, what Gentili said was that you understand the goal, you practice, you generate a whole lot of solutions of how to do this particular task. And then you either fixate that, you pick the best one and you stick with it. And that would be like, you know, if you're swimming in a swimming pool, you stick the, you find the best stroke and you stick with it. Whereas if you're going to do open, open sea swimming, you want a range of stroke styles because the conditions are so variable, you want to adapt a lot. So you adapt, you maybe choose like five or six different options. That's called diversifying. So we either fixate or we diversify or we do something in between. And again, in ATM, we do that. You, fix, you can fixate and do one kind of thing. So one, the, the one way of kind of standing on your hip, but then you introduce variations. So you diversify it and then you come back to the one way that gets better and so on. So then but we, we want to diversify because what you learn on the floor here, you want to diversify to take into your real life. So that's when you get people to do things in different orientations, like different positions. And then think about it in a different environment completely outside of the room, off the mat, and so forth. So we're, we're probably more about diversifying skill than fixating skill. But you need to understand that both are important. Next. Practical applications of motor learning. So considering transfer of learning to a new task, a new environment. Yes, this is the end of the lesson dilemma. This is why we're, you know, you were very correct last week, a lot of you to identify that this is what you want to get better at because it's where, where the, the sort of learning here that's quite abstract becomes real life. So that's, that one liner is what we're spending a lot of time talking about this week. Um, that you don't actually have to physically practice something for motor learning to occur, you can do mental practice. Again, remember, this is, a, you know, this is not a lecture that I wrote for you guys. This is, this is now in the public discourse about mental rehearsal. And the two forms of mental practice, kinesthetic or third person, kinesthetic or first person um, imagery is when I feel myself doing the movement in my mind. Third person mental practice is visual I see myself so normally at this point in the lecture I would ask the students to um, do just shut their eyes and do a task like stand up and walk to the door so don't do it so you this and then they get them to tell me whether it's they do it in first person or third person so in here we actually get better implicitly at the first person the kinesthetic by nature, my, my, if you ask me spontaneously, I would be a third person. That's what I do best. Um, however, I'm learning to be better at the first person imagery. I'm learning to sense, use other modalities in my mental imagery other than vision. But it's a skill. Some, so who's a, who spontaneously is first person in them? Yeah, most dancers are. Who's spontaneously visual? Me, yeah, and I'm learning. So, okay, so there's that. Now, feedback, uh, we've already talked about. There's intrinsic feedback. So this is coming from our own senses. 
So our somato sensation, um, that's intrinsic feedback. Extrinsic feedback is me telling you about how you, how, what you're doing, how well you're doing it. Um, so that's extrinsic. It's coming from external. In Feldenkrais, we are about training the intrinsic. If you, if you can give them extrinsic feedback, um, and that is um, more a feature of uh, FI, obviously, the, the issue with extrinsic feedback is that it's addictive. So you rely on an external source of information and you get addicted to the external source because you have given the external source the credibility and the validity. So it's really good for quick learning, extrinsic feedback. Long term, extrinsic feedback is addictive. So you want people to switch from extrinsic to intrinsic because then it's sustainable. They can be addicted to themselves is perfectly fine. But they can't be addicted to us. You know, my joke is it's really good, it's a really good business model for them to be addicted to you, but it's not good from a self-efficacy point of view. Yep. So it's quick, it's very easy, it's very accurate. Extrinsic feedback from an expert. I can tell you what you're doing, but it's got its downside. Intrinsic is harder, slower, in the long term better. Now, you can either have feedback during the performance, like as I'm moving, I'm sensing myself or watching myself or you're telling me, and I can get knowledge of results afterwards. How do I feel afterwards? And again, this should ring a bell with you with Feldenkrais is that we're doing both. You're paying attention during the movement, so it's knowledge of performance all the time. And then you stop the movement and you pay attention to the results. Now, that's a fairly loose interpretation of the knowledge of results. Um, this comes from a lot of, you know, sports sciences, actually. The knowledge of results is like how many baskets did I shoot, you know, or how fast did I do that 100 metres? You know, it's quite an objective knowledge of results. We don't go quite so into that objective knowledge of results, but we're still stopping scanning and evaluating what's happened. Exactly. Exactly. And again, so isn't it nice that some little boffany science some people somewhere have given these all fancy names for what we do? And this is, all, this is like post Feldenkrais. He didn't, he didn't have this language. This is all comes out of the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, it just doesn't have the name Feldenkrais on it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Carol Connors from Melbourne here, she did a, um, a bit of an analysis of the languaging in Feldenkrais lessons and matched it to this language to show that, yes, these quality, these things that are known in movement science appear in this form in Feldenkrais. So it's a really good article. Maybe we should send that around. Yeah, so it's nice. It's a nice one. Is there any more slides? I can't remember. Okay, we might do this later. Yeah, it's lunchtime. It's 10 to 1. That's a lot of talking. What's the next one? Oh, yeah, we don't have to worry about that. Uh, we'll do, that, we'll do that, those last two slides after lunch. Because these, are, I've been mentioning these a little bit. Um, all right, so we'll come back to this after lunch. Oh, no, we won't. Because after lunch, we're going to have a play. So come back at um, 10 to 1, uh, 10 to 2, like on time. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, because I don't have to teach, you see, so I don't care. Um, all right. Let's say come back at 5 to 2 so that you're ready to kick off at 2. <laughs>